All right. All right. Well, I just hit record, so I am ready when you are. All right. Let me get my lighting situation straight. Sure. There we go. All right. All right. There we go. That's much oh, better. Yeah, it looks great. All right. Welcome, Rich Monroe, to the REI Society podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Brandon. Thanks so much for enjoying me to, to come spend some time with you on this podcast. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So how, how do you feel about Atlanta's three-month rainy season that we're having uh, so far? Yeah, it's, you know, I live up on Lake Lanier, so we're 10 feet above pool. It's like historically the highest it's ever been. And, you know, so we're, we're, it's a little scary when you're watching the rain come down, but you're also watching it rise in your backyard, too. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, um, man, I tell you, I, I – I just want to stay dry. This, this makes me want to get out of flipping homes right now. I want to do more short-term rentals because I'm tired of looking at properties in the rain. So obviously you're here and you specialize in short-term rentals. And uh, I've got a lot of questions for you that I think will help the audience. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to get started. If you don't mind just telling us who Rich Monroe is, uh, where you've been, where you're at now, where you're going, anything you want to throw in, and I'll just help you narrate that story along the way. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I started in real estate probably about 15 years ago with tax lien investing. Mm -hmm. And just before that, I, I owned a consumer debt buying company, which like a lot of industries in the recession kind of got hit hard. You know, we basically uh, were the whole space was buying distressed debt from the banks and doing uh, collections activities on those accounts. And so for, for me, kind of a natural progression away from that space was to acquire tax liens in, in a similar manner. You have attorneys that have to service those uh, accounts and basically put them through um, clear title and, and being able to you know, foreclose on the property. So mm -hmm. uh, having been in that space for probably 15 years before that, 15, 20 years experience in that space, we spent a lot of time with legislative activities. So I was involved with a, a kind of a, an association that focused on state legislative efforts, federal efforts, going into DC and meeting with senators and representatives and talking about the, the ways that uh, those laws and the language in those laws affect the industry. And right. so ironically come full circle, that's been pretty beneficial right now with what's going on in the short-term rental space, mm -hmm. where we're basically all hands on deck, not only in Georgia, but kind of all across the nation and determining what those new rules and regulations are gonna be uh, to, to uh, regulate that space. Right, right. Well, I'll tell you what, so let's, uh, we will touch that, uh, touch on that here again in a few minutes. Um, why don't we start off with Diamond Edge properties and Diamond Edge short-term rentals? If I understand correctly, I believe you used to flip homes and you're not doing that so much anymore. Is that correct? That's correct. So, you know, having gone through uh, the tax lien space and really understanding properties in their worst shape, you know, you've got properties that would be, you know, vacant for 10, 15 years in some cases in really bad shape. And, you know, we, we had a pretty aggressive strategy to acquire properties in Georgia as well as in Maryland, which has very similar redemption laws. And so we, we acquired probably about 350 properties through that process over about five years and really learned the ins and outs of distressed real estate. Uh, we, most of those properties we sold to other investors and let them do a rehab and, um, and, and, you know, but kind of learned the process from that. And then so after the tax liens, we also went off and did uh, acquisitions for rehab properties. And we did some new, new construction as well. And um, like most investors, we kind of were on our, on our way to developing kind of a rental portfolio and a buy and hold strategy. And, you know, we were on our way, probably had seven or eight rental properties. And this is a little over two years ago. And we started looking at the short-term rental model. And in, in, for me, it was kind of a light bulb moment about two years ago when we looked at this and you've got all the, the, the obvious pros that come along with doing short-term rentals compared to traditional rentals. The right. properties are in much better shape. Uh, the you know, the uh, kitchen doesn't get used as much and you can pretty much blink your eyes for two to three years out and have a comparison of a property that's been through traditional rental versus short-term rental. And you might have to do a little bit of touch-up paint on the short-term rental one and uh, because of them you know bumping their luggage into it and then your your property's in very very great shape so for me as well as not having to deal with the evictions right before the holidays things of that nature 
uh, the short term model business for me um, made sense. And simple math, right? It's two yeah. to three times the revenue you can make with short term models than what you can do with a traditional model. And yeah. so we, yeah. we began and, and built a model that was basically scalable from the beginning uh, to basically grow that business. And so over the last two and a half years, we've gone from um, you know, starting out with one or two listings up to uh, right now we have about 18 uh, listings. I think we just went live um, this weekend with our, our 19th listing. So, wow. Congrats. Congrats. So, so you're, are you doing, are you doing ownership or arbitrage or a little mixture of both? We're doing a mixture of both and as well as management. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've, we've got properties that we own. We've got properties that we have through master leases or rental arbitrage. And then we also do management of properties for other real estate investors. And typically it's someone that's done a great job with a rehab, but the property hasn't sold. Mm -hmm. And so we will um, come in and, and stage it and, and do short term models for them and kind of do it as a management. So we've got kind of all three of those going on at the same time for those, those listings. Right. Right. Um, so when you, when you do management, I mean, I, I typically, I think the short-term rental space, the property manager, the management company, they're receiving what 25 to 30%, uh, 20 to 30% low to high, I guess, quarter where you're from or where you're located. Is that uh, what we're seeing here in the Atlanta space uh, with, with diamond edge? That's about right. It's okay. in that range. Okay. What do you like better? Do you like management ownership or rental arbitrage? Well, each of them have their own unique uh, uh, pros and cons. And, and so for us, it's been successful because we've developed such a systemized process that's automated. Uh, for us, it's indifferent when we go live, whether we own it, lease it, or own it, or manage it, it's all getting rolled into the exact same solution. And so for us, um, I don't know that I have a preference one way or the other. I think it's good to have some diversity in business. And you know that's worked well for us so far. Right, right. Well, do you feel like you're you're hitting any kind of legislative uh, pitfalls that uh, you know being regulated in different cities and counties and things like that? Uh, I know we have several counties surrounding Atlanta that is not for the short-term rental sector, and uh, you know I know you're one of the persons leading the pack to try to push back on that a little bit. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit more about that, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. So I'm actually a board member of a statewide association called Stroaga. Mm -hmm. So it's a short-term rental owners association of Georgia and Pam O'Dell is the executive director who has um, got, you know, a couple of decades of experience of lobbying uh, at the state capitol in Georgia uh, comes with all the relationships that are needed there uh, for the, for the legislators there. Um, so I've, I've been actively involved with looking at uh, what's going on with each city and each county, even the city of Atlanta still has not uh, clearly defined what the regulations are going to be. And so we've been on a campaign to encourage folks, whether you're doing short-term rentals now or not, uh, there's a window of opportunity here in the next, call it 12 to 16 to 18 months, where all these different local jurisdictions are gonna be determining the rules. And if we don't have a seat at that table and don't have a voice, there's gonna be some unintended consequences that have already occurred in places like Forsyth County, mm -hmm. Peachtree Corners, the city of College Park, and and so on so you know what are those we, consequences if you don't mind me asking yeah sure so what unfortunately what typically tends to happen is these things get brought to the agenda of the planning and zoning commission when there's a neighbor or a neighborhood that's complaining about an issue that's occurred mm -hmm. and usually it's kind of the one-off horror stories the same type of thing that you see in the news about the party houses and things like that However, what happens is the, the legislators and the, the, the commissioners start making decisions based on those one or two different examples without hearing kind of all the different uh, other things that come into play with short-term rentals. And so Cobb County, for instance, uh, uh, they've actually delayed their, their vote on putting the ordinances in place until April, but the last hearing, they are doing things because one neighbor said there's a guy that's from out of town that's been doing short-term rentals in their neighborhood. He's hard to get a hold of. And so they actually wrote it into the ordinance. Uh, initially it was the owner or the property manager has to be there in 30 minutes of any incident. Uh, they've recently changed that to an hour. Um, but that's just one example, as well as in the same vein, uh, they want to make an adjustment so that if you um, want to do short-term rentals in Cobb County, County, you can only do it if it's your primary residence. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't work for folks that have 
uh, been able to supplement their income that have, you know, changed uh, properties and things like that. So that's just two examples of, of just a knee jerk reaction that, that can very easily get voted into law if we don't have uh, Stroaga and, you know, other folks having a seat at the table to talk about some other alternate solutions. Yeah. You know, one of the good news while we're on the topic is uh, that there's some activity on the state level mm -hmm. for a preemptive bill, which would basically uh, prevent any local jurisdiction from outright banning short-term rentals. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we're all for regulations. We're all for kind of defining what those tax revenue um, payment allocations look like. All of that makes sense, but to outright ban it, it's really just a property rights issue and something that um, I think on the state level, we're hoping uh, we can address it as well so that we can prevent some of the local jurisdictions from doing that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's scary. I mean, it's, uh, it's I mean, they have the power to push us out if, if they really want to. And like you said, right. if we don't have a voice and we're not involved, you know, I'm a short-term, uh, more of a short-term vacation rental owner, but uh, I'm, I'm about to release two more here in Atlanta. I've got some flips that aren't selling and they're in really good areas. East Atlanta Village, I've got one in, uh, Gresham Park. I'm I am wanting to keep those so that I can cash flow them and um, you know create a little bit of abundance in my own life. And these aren't in like you know small pocket neighborhoods and uh, they're they're in walkable communities and things like that. So I think it's yeah I I think it would be okay to have a short term rental in there. Uh, obviously in a, a PUD or an HOA, I think it would you know that maybe you know maybe I would agree that it would be a little tough to to decide on that, but. Yeah, I, I don't like the fact that, uh, you know, we're, what, we're 10 years in on Airbnb and uh, all of the disrupted uh, rip, disruption that they've created. Um, but, you know, we see that they've created, you know, many, many people uh, uh, who, have, uh, who have created wealth for themselves. They've, you know, become a really big public company and things like that. Um, they kind of led the charge and now you have all these different companies that are coming up uh, booking.com or or people are doing their own independent bookings now i think uh i like it i mean my opinion is i like it and i'm for it i am really really nervous about what comes next as people keep lobbying against it especially the hotel industry and uh, things like that and just trying to push people out uh, especially in the vacation sides of town where i'm uh, keeping most of my properties what do you feel uh, what do you feel like is the biggest burden uh, for short-term owners right now uh, in this in this uh, i don't know this legislative issues that we're we're, we're seeing yeah, I mean, the biggest burden, I think, is, is dealing with, uh, you know, kind of the one-off horror stories. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of press with the parties that occur, the violence, um, the shootings, and uh, the thefts. And at the end of the day, I mean, there's 14,000 listings in, in, in Georgia. There's thousands of guests that come into short-term rentals every week. And for these one-off, uh, you know, Bad actors are everywhere, right? So for these one-off horror stories to cause a broad stroke is 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 very unfortunate. And you know, unfortunately, it's that's just kind of the way the press works. They kind of gravitate to some of those uh, negative things. But um, I think that's somewhat been the challenge for us. I think one of the positive things with the Stroaga Association being in place, we probably about three weeks, three or four weeks ago, had a uh, a large um, couple of mansions that were on on a street. And um, this host was basically doing parties for three or four months, not caring what the neighbors said. And it took Stroaga to come in and get involved after hearing about it to um, meet with the council member, meet with the neighbors. And we were actively involved with basically getting that bad actor delisted. And mm. so it's, it's really, you know, we've really kind of all got to come together as a community to assist with self-policing this thing to make sure that we can keep it under control. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's a few bad seats for sure. And then, you know, us as short-term rental owners, like you said, we need to band together to, to help protect uh, <laughs> the name short-term rental owners and, uh, or the, the league of short-term rental owners, whatever you want to call it, but also to try to push the bad seed out uh, of ownership uh, in the, in this business and, or, um, you know, try to, I guess, curate a plan where we can mitigate as much of this, bad publicity that that's coming along but you know the thing is is this is in every industry almost i mean there's a bad seed in every freaking industry it's not just 
it's not just property ownership and specifically short-term rental ownership. So what would you say to that? I mean, what's your thoughts if I, if I ask you um, to define that what can differ us from short-term rentals to another space uh, so that we can be proactive where people are more accepting of short-term rentals um, based on negative publicity from other, you know, whatever. Right. Well, I think it, I think it starts with, you know, education and certification process so that if you are a member of Stroaga, uh, there's certain things that you comply with, you know, pretty much all of the hosts that I know that, uh, that we meet with do not allow parties, uh, are very, you know, at the end of the day, it's in our best interest to keep our neighbors happy. Um, and so have a standard practice that we all kind of adhere to and agree to. And if you're a Stroaga member, and you adhere to those guidelines, then you know that's that's kind of helping with standardizing everything. Sure. And you know, there's a lot of tools in the industry that can help us. There's noise detection devices, uh, electronic locks, cameras, and so on that that help you manage your listing. And you know, I think we can at least get a starting point with uh, making a lot of those things standard for the folks that are doing uh, hosting of, of of guests at their short-term rentals, so that we can all be consistent with it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Well, let's shift gears for a moment. Um, let's just kind of break this up a little bit. What's your, uh, what do you feel like is your favorite? Uh, I, I don't know. What do, what do you feel like is, is your favorite job in this industry as far as did you like, uh, did you like flipping better? Or do you like short term rental management better? What, what do you feel like you're, you, you loved a little bit more, you know, going from the, the latter to now? Yeah, I, you know, I, I basically, you know, one of the things that kind of shifted us as a core focus to short term rentals and, and, you know, my wife and my sons are in the business as well. You know, my sons are involved with marketing as well as um, the contracting side. They wow. probably disagree with me. Uh, what's that? How old are your sons? You don't mind asking? Uh, yeah. So we have three boys and uh -huh. um, the youngest is 26. The oldest, the uh, middle one's 30 and the oldest is like 34. So they're all kind of four years apart. Okay. And, and so, you know, our, our sons have been involved in the business as well. And, you know, even back in the tax lien days, you know, we would, it's similar to, to mortgage foreclosures. So the, the auctions occur on the first Tuesday of every month. And if you're trying to, put a lot of money to work and acquire a lot of properties, you've got to be in, you know, five or six counties on that same day. So we would go out as a team and do a due diligence a few days before each auction and actually uh, be present at those auctions. So our, our, our sons would participate in, in, in a big part of that process as well. And, you know, so, but anyway, back to the original question, I, you know, I think they would, some of them would probably disagree with me, but me personally, I didn't really enjoy, or I still don't enjoy, kind of the, the rehab contractor aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, most real real estate investors, that's the biggest challenge is, is, is putting the right team together to get the right quality of work. So that part of the business, I don't miss as much right. um, in, terms, mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, what, what I would uh, prefer doing. And short-term rentals for me, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a little bit of a different animal. You're not putting a tenant in there for 12 months and, and maybe talk to them a couple times uh, in the year, this is a hospitality business. So we're in constant communication with the guests before they arrive, while they're here, and even after they leave. And, uh, you know, it creates a different dynamic and a, a different team set and different mindset. You know, everything is, is kind of focused around that guest experience. Um, so from the cleaners to the maintenance folks to um, the customer service folks that are handling a lot of the messaging, you know, that's kind of the end game. And so for me, I, I kind of enjoy putting that together and, you know, be, being a super host and maintaining that, you know, close to five star review uh, right. average. And so, you know, that, that aspect of it, I kind of enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's a, it's a hospitality business for sure. I kind of thrive on it. I think I'm about to shift gears and go more into short term rentals myself because I'm, I'm just burnt out on flipping and, been doing it for 17 years and, and, you know, the design and everything, just, I don't know what's going on right now, but the buyers are picky and you can't even make them the nicest. Of the, I mean, you can't give them the best design out there uh, that they would appreciate. I mean, there, there's always something that they feel like uh, you're lacking on as a seller and, uh, and then they beat you up and it's just like, I'm, you know, the more volume I do, the more I'm looking at these properties, like, why don't I just convert these over into rentals? I'm doing the work anyways. I can uh, seek the depreciation. 
Uh, I probably won't get the phantom loss, losses because they throw off so much income, like you said, two and a half, three times uh, the, uh, the monthly amounts. But, you know, I can, do, I can get the loan pay down. Um, you know, I can have the, the abundance of income uh, when, I, when I create mass uh, quantity over a, a period of a few years. So I like that aspect. I think it's a, it's a good way to also do the Burr method. Um, you know, a lot of people are, you know, buying the properties, renovating them, um, you know, all that good stuff and then renting them out and you know, whatever the rest of it is, res uh, you know, whatever the burn method is. Anyways, they're refinancing it and doing it all over again, repeating. So that's, uh, I I've kind of looking at this as a wealth building challenge for myself right now to kind of switch gears. I'm going to keep flipping until the numbers make sense to walk away. But I think sometime in the next year to 18 months, I am completely done with flipping. Obviously, I'll still be renovating and making a beautiful home. But uh, for me, particularly, I, 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 I like ownership. I like, I like ownership. And uh, uh, I want to I want to hear your your mindset uh, on arbitrage versus ownership after I tell you what my plans are. But my plans are in the next uh, three years is to have 30 more properties by the in the next two months, I'll have five total. So I want to go all in and create a, like a, a Southern charm boutique home chain. Be a ho I want to become a hotelier. I want them all over the uh, vacation rental destinations all over the Southeast, um, Nashville, uh, you know, where, wherever we're not having problems, you know, or I can have a license legally, uh, Savannah, Hilton Head, uh, Helen, Georgia, anywhere in the Southeast that's a, that has a, almost a year draw uh, where it's not seasonal. But for the most part of the year, uh, it's, it, you know, tourists are coming in. And from there, I can just do one after another, after another, after another. And when I have 30 properties, I'm creating, you know, let's, let's, let's say a 25 to 30% cap rate. Well, my exit strategy is as I'm branding this hotelier chain is in 30 years, I mean, I'm sorry, in, in three years, I would like to be able to block sell some of these off to some of these hedge funds that uh, right now they're paying their investors on trailer parks or, or regular rental properties, uh, single family homes, eight to 9%. Nobody's given uh, double digit returns. So if I can double down from 30 to, let's just say 12%, a little more than double down on the cap rate, uh, I can kind of double up, I guess I could say, uh, for myself and value. So I look at it as this, I'm gonna end it with this and hear your rebuttal on it. But uh, I'm really curious. I've been dying to ask you this question for a while. Um, but I feel like if I can do that and, and sell this off to a chain like that, it allows me not to only um, create a sellable company, but it allows me to create multiple uh, million dollar exit strategy if I can find a buyer that will buy them in blocks and or the whole package all together. And I can be completely out of the game in three to four years. If all goes well, let's just say 10 years if it doesn't, if I just keep going down the narrow path, but an arbitrage. So I let all that with a little context there, but an arbitrage, you don't really own the property. I see that it's making people millionaires right now. You got, uh, what is his name? Chita or Sheta or whatever his name is. Um, mm -hmm. or, and, and then you've got other people that are doing it. They're, they're really going after the arbitrage and they're creating tons of income every month but do they really own the benefits of the wealth building uh, techniques that real estate owners have? Um, I guess in the end all, does it matter because they're making money and they can exit? My only fear, this is where I'm going to end. My only fear is, is if these cities continue to, to make it illegal uh, or, or they really, really regulate it where it's just tough to own a short-term rental, the, the owners of the, that are doing arbitrage um, they're going to be completely wiped out where somebody is, uh, like me. Yeah. I might get, you know, punched in the groin, but I'm kind of diversifying it all over the, in different areas and that, with asset allocation essentially. And I can actually sell my, pr I, I can actually sell the one or two that are having the problems and do a 1031 tax free exchange and buy another. So I guess the question is what, what, what is, I, I wouldn't say it's a challenge or anything, but or a rebuttal you know, that I'm expecting from you, but, I want to see the other side of it. Like what would make somebody like me want to do arbitrage or, or if you could, which if you could persuade somebody like me with this mentality to do arbitrage, what would you fire back at? Uh, and, and why, if that makes sense? I know that was a long question, but um, yeah, no, I, I get your it. side. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. So the just to, so when you started out, you talked about Savannah, some of the vacation places. So there was a recent study that was done on rental arbitrage that looks statistically across the United States on the um, difference between your short-term rental revenue to what your rent amount is. Mm -hmm. And across the country, uh, not surprisingly, Florida was number one. Right. Um, Georgia was actually fourth on the list. And within the state of Georgia, the number one county and city was Chatham County, hmm. right? And so the spread between what you can do a, a lease for and what your short-term rental potential would be is $1,900 mm -hmm. for Chatham County on average. Right. And when you start looking at the numbers, for you to have that monthly cash flow as an average potential, and for me, just like you, you talked about, I'm, I'm gonna be in other areas. So even though I'm doing potentially some master leases and um, rental arbitrage, I'm still having some diversification against the regulation risk because sure. I'm able to do it in different locations, right? So that, that is the same. The other thing is, is that you are able to basically engage with uh, controlling the property, having that cash flow, and you can engage with multifamily developers that might have, you know, 50 units, 100 units, 200 units, offset their vacancy rates right. and step in and become a partner within a syndicate such that you're basically doing a 10 year master lease. So somebody acquires a new development, for example, or an old development, and they apply this uh, model in there and you put in place master leases. So now all of a sudden, you've got what used to be a, a much different cap rate situation before and now it's has changed. So there's some other strategic things that you can do with rental arbitrage mm -hmm. that basically put you in that same ownership equity position. Yeah. No, and, it's, it's brilliant. It's, yeah. That's, that's what I wanted to hear. I, I didn't know where you're going to go. I didn't, I've never even thought about that concept, but I, uh, that's what I love about real estate. It's so creative that uh, even if you think, not that I think I know all the answers, but even if you think you, you, you have it all together or somebody like you that, that has another extra strategy that is just mind blowing. So I always love to just talk with people that's a little bit more sophisticated uh, or, or on the same level or above me um, because it's, you know, it, it's just, it's just a fun conversation. So, There's always a different angle. There's yeah. always a different angle to approach it. And and so, yeah, so I think there's some interesting strategies that you can go after that way. Not to mention the, the ability to go after multiple cash flow streams versus doing one at a time if you're doing an acquisition, right? So you're, yeah. you're just able to do a lot more quicker as well. So. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm, you know, I've been doing this for four or five years and I'm still on number three. Now I've got two of them I'm about to convert over, but yeah, I'm going to get a little more aggressive. So you're absolutely right. Um, all right. Well, so, t so you got a family business. Uh, you're, you're all in on short term rentals. You're, are in uh you're a board member of Swaga and you are also doing some workshops on short term rentals and, and rental arbitrage. So tell me about that a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, beyond the workshops, it really began with uh monthly meetings. So every month I have uh two different meetings. One is with South Atlanta Ria. It's uh, uh towards the end of the month. It's the last Tuesday of every month actually. And the other one is with Atlanta Rio. That one's in the middle of uh, the month. It's the second Tuesday of the month. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the scope behind and the agenda behind both meetings are for other folks that are either already doing short-term rentals or aspiring to do short-term rentals and talk about best practices, uh, some of the tools that we can uh, use in the industry. And then like we've talked about before, kind of um, grassroots efforts and being able to talk about legislative activities and, you know, exchange thoughts and ideas about that. So we started with those and we've been doing that for several years now where uh, it's usually a mixture of folks that are, you know, like myself that have multiple listings and then others that are just starting and want to learn. And then others that don't, that, that are, you know, real estate agents or property managers that just want to learn more about this space. Mm -hmm. And we started getting uh, inquiries for folks that wanted to, to learn a little bit more about it. So we've done a kind of a full day workshop 
that's kind of the basics of short-term rentals. You know, we start the morning off with talking about marketing and uh, analysis. Uh, how do you know what areas to look at? How do the numbers work? How do you compare that to traditional rental? It doesn't work all the time because sometimes there are spaces where the traditional rentals command a premium and the numbers get very close, even with short-term rentals. And so we talk about that aspect of it. Yeah. Then we look into so how do you set up a property? How do you stage a property? What's involved with that? Yeah. Um, and all the ins and outs and all the, the suggestions and recommendations to get fully up and, and running. And then we also look at the most important part is building the team is, you know, the cleaners, the, the maintenance folks. And, um, you know, that's really kind of where the rubber meets the road. If you don't have that team together and everything's based on reviews, you're not going to last too, too much longer if you don't have that in place. And, um, yeah. That's a big part of what we cover as well. And then, so we went from doing those full day workshops to also doing uh, property tours. And this, this past weekend, actually, we did a property tour with um, two of our properties in Pond City Market, Virginia Highlands area, uh, that are actually done through rental arbitrage. And we kind of walked them through. And then also looked at all the numbers and how the, the recent activity on the performance, uh, even though January and February is traditionally slower months, we had like an 87% occupancy uh, uh, in those units and, and kind of walking through the numbers, how that compares to what a traditional rental amount would be. Um, and so that's something we're going to probably do on a quarterly basis. Um, uh, the, some of the workshops I'm partnered up with uh, Joe Castaneda yeah. and uh, we've, we've formed a group called B, B and B investing workshop and we're, we're kind of expanding. So we're going to be doing another workshop in Orlando, uh, which is a big short term rental market, obviously oh, yeah. partnering mm -hmm. with some folks down there that already have uh, 30 plus listings. And uh, we're going to do that one on May 2nd. And we're also looking at some other areas like Tampa, uh, Chattanooga, and uh, in North Carolina as well to do the yeah. same thing. Well, I tell you what, I hope to be owners of all those uh, areas very soon. And uh, I want to come to one of your uh, meetups. I mean, these are your workshops. This sounds awesome. Um, you know, I feel like I feel like within my, my uh, first three, we're doing really, really well. We're five-star super host really quick. Um, you know, we're... I mean, between the three, you're probably throwing off 140 to $150,000 a year net. Uh, so I've got the Hilton Head property. We've got the Savannah property. We've got the Blue Ridge property. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to own more. But uh, yeah, I, I would love to come and just you know, monitor your, your workshops and see what you're doing with that because it's, it's just a fun business. A um, couple more uh, quick short-term rental questions. Um, you know, what I love about short-term rentals is you can leverage technology. Um, it, it's, it's the most fun part for a tech nerd like me. What's your uh, favorite technology you have on your short-term rentals, whether it's a, a certain doorknob or a certain camera system on the exterior of the home or, or you know, sound, you know, monitors? What's your, what's your favorite well, one or two pieces? Yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of like the, the noise detection device. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of measures the level of sound and in some of the properties that we have, like, for example, our Pont City Market Apartments, that that building was built in 1920 and it's got the original floors in it. And both of our units are on the top level. And so it doesn't take much for the neighbors to kind of hear what's going on. So I've got thresholds set very low there. And uh, this device will basically shoot me a quick text if the noise levels go above a certain level. It, it can be adjusted based on the time of night. And so if it's like, you know, one o'clock in the morning and I get a text, I can tap the guest on the shoulder and say, hey, just want to check in, make sure everything's okay, rather than waiting for the neighbor to call and, uh, you know, have a complaint about it. So it's, it's a nice way to be proactive, uh, as well as some of our higher end homes that have, um, you know, large pools and large outdoor areas. Uh, you can have the device outdoors as well. And for the same reason, we have quiet times after 10 p.m., not to disturb yeah. neighbors and and so it's just a good way to kind of restrict and be very proactive with any potential problem guests that might come up. If, if you got a text in the middle of the night and it's a little bit loud, would, how would you word that through um, home away or Airbnb to the guests? I mean, would it be something like, Hey, one of the neighbors just uh, told me they heard a little extra noise. I was just checking in to see if everything was okay. How's it well, going? So, yeah, so I, and you probably know this is ready as well. The, yeah. the fact that you have a noise detection device or surveillance or any of any kind, you have to fully disclose that in the listing. Yep. And so it's not, it shouldn't be a, a secret that we have noise detection devices. 
And so I don't really go into the neighbor did, you know, called us or anything like that. It's, hey, I recognize that there's some loud music playing or there's, you know, a lot of people talking loudly outside and we right. have, you know, neighbors that are trying to get to bed for school and work. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, it, it, because you're fully disclosing from the beginning what's going on, it's not really uh, uh, a secret that we can detect the noise levels if it gets too loud. And right. usually, usually when you do that, they know that they're doing something <laughs> you know they'll they'll respond pretty quickly and or yeah. they'll totally ignore it right so it's one of the two responses that you'll get yeah i had a uh I had a gentleman in the middle of the night playing drums one time wait what is going on i mean is everything okay oh i'm so sorry i'll stop right now immediately so yeah yeah you're you're right um let's see i've got i've got two more questions and we can kind of do the traditional everybody every podcast uh rapid fire questions at the end but Two more, two more short-term rental-related questions, and then if you have anything you want to promote more on, uh, like your workshops or anything else, or tell us how to get involved with Stroaga, uh, if you're here in, in Georgia, um, you know, be be all, uh, just to let us know. But sure. I'm kind of looking for, I'm always looking for funny stories or horror stories. So, what is your worst uh, story as a short-term rental owner? Uh, I've, I've publicly announced that I had a renter flood my home in Savannah and how to deal with an insurance situation with that. Uh, if you don't know that story, I can tell you about it later, but uh, what's uh, one of the most funniest or one of the most horrible stories you've, you've, or you've experienced? Well, uh, there's really two different categories there. You know, yeah, I, I think funny <laughs> is, you know, we had, uh, uh, this guy was from Vegas yeah. And to put it in perspective, we probably hosted last year close to 900 guests and we probably met one or two of them in person, right? So everything's self-check-in, it's automated. There's really not that big of a reason to kind of meet folks in person. And a lot of times the guests prefer it that way, right? That's whole right. part of the experience. Um, but we had this one particular guest at one of our, our Virginia Highlands properties that uh, as soon as he checked in, uh, basically sent us a message along the lines of, uh, oh my God, this bed is too small. I can't handle this. Uh, you have to move me. And I, you know, it was going on and on about the bed. And um, apparently, you know, and so, I, you know, the first thing is you want to try to accommodate and basically get them relocated to uh, another listing, which we did have another apartment not a few blocks away. Uh, and we, I ended up having to meet him to get him into the other uh, apartment. And this guy was probably, I don't know, had four or five Louis Vuitton bags, like, you know, <laughs> dressed very extravagantly and right. very flamboyant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, he was going on and on about how bad that bed was. And then we brought him to the next apartment, which I was kind of like reluctant to take him there because it wasn't that much different than the other one. Right, and then right. he was so he was so ecstatic and excited about how nice this apartment was, and, and actually the apartment wasn't as nice because it was in a downstairs basement apartment with less windows, so it was kind of like a cave, so to speak. Uh, and but yet he was he was thrilled to death and was you know ecstatic about it, and very, so he went from like very like angry to very happy like within a few minutes, and it was just kind of kind of a funny experience. Uh, yeah, I would say. Um, that's awesome. You know, yeah. And, and so the one or two times that we meet a guest, it's kind of that type of experience that, uh, that makes you laugh about it. So, yeah, I, uh, I've, I've got a, a really quick, funny story. I'll tell you, I had a, uh, my property in Blue Ridge. We, we launched last year, uh, last fall and <laughs> the first guest ever stayed in the property, hit us up in the, in the middle of the night. Oh my gosh, you've got bed bugs. I'm like, excuse me there's no way possible you are the first guest there <laughs> and we wash our sheets if, if, even if you weren't and and we make sure that this is the most cleanest place on any property that we we we, we uh, own or manage and she's like no 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 no. i'm gonna have to go see a doctor next week and make sure you're not gonna be liable for my doctor bills i'm like go for it of course i'm scared i'm like oh shoot what is wrong what happened uh, she leaves after the weekend, sends us pictures through Airbnb, completely ate up, goes to the doctor, which I'm like, you know, at this point, I'm like, she's being a little pushy and, and a little ridiculous. 
and she makes it known that she is torn up. Well, she comes back the next day, like two or three days later, uh, the next day after sending them all these pictures. Oh, by the way, I thought it uh, was your bed and bed bugs. I thought it, maybe it was your hot tub and you guys put too many chemicals in it. But it was just uh, chiggers. It was like mosquitoes and chiggers that got us from outside. I'm like, you know you were in the woods, right? In, in the North Georgia mountains. She didn't reply. I'm like, good Lord. I, uh, but yeah, it had me on edge a little bit. Um, all right. Well, I guess uh, that was your funny story. We don't have to go into a worse story, but uh, who's some other short-term rental leaders you follow yourself or uh, somebody that you feel like is kind of leading the market, um, maybe like yourself and beyond? Uh, who's, some, who's some other influencers that, you know, we can all look up to? Yeah, and there's, there's a couple different guys that are doing not only just local, but kind of on a global level that, uh, you know, have done quite well. You know, Brian Page uh, has an online course and kind of focuses on rental uh, arbitrage. Uh, then there's Eric Moeller who does, um, his kind of gig is doing more of a co-hosting or kind of a management style. And, you know, both of these guys are probably, you know, close to a hundred listings. And, um, you know, there's, there's kind of an international uh, membership mastermind of folks that are, you know, at that level. And so, you know, I really think that this is really at the beginning stages as far as opportunity goes. and you know, really the start of, 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 of the way that this thing is going to going to flush out. But there's already a lot of folks that are doing, you know, like I said, 100 plus listings and, and yeah. really just putting putting it, putting things in place that uh, run it like a business and, 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 and make it very scalable. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, I'm really excited about the short term rental business and where it's going specifically because uh, I feel like it's almost like a new asset class, even though there's been rentals and destinations like Gatlinburg, Tennessee, or, or wherever else uh, like that uh, for, for decades. Uh, now that uh, HomeAway or VRBO used to own that market back in the 90s and whatnot, early 2000s, now that Airbnb's here and really kind of put it on the pedestal per se, I feel like these properties, you know, real residential real estate for uh, anybody that owns or manages, if they go to sell, they're not going to sell at a comp price anymore. Like a regular piece of real estate, it's going to be treated more like multifamily because of the, it's thrown off so many, get so much in gains. So it's going to be considered, uh, you know, or appraised at the income approach, which really excites me um, for all of us when we do kind of have our exit strategy years down the road. Um, so I'm like, you know, it's got my attention over the years and, yeah, that's, that's why I wanted to have you on, just kind of get some of your uh, your thoughts and processes, and of course, let all the other people in my uh, uh, podcast listen to, to to you and find out who you are. Uh, with that said, um, before we go into the rapid fire questions, I want to make sure uh, if, if there's anything else you want to promote outside of Strelaga or or your workshops, um, you know, feel free to go ahead and do it, and I'll give you an opportunity to pitch it right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the ways that we've developed kind of a, a core group of folks is on our Facebook page, which is Atlanta Short-Term Rental Investors. And so you have to inquire to join that group. But uh, any updates regarding meetings and workshops, everything kind of filters to that Facebook group, Atlanta Short-Term Rental Investors. And then we also have a strong short-term rental owners uh, networking group as well, which is also a Facebook group. And so we've probably got close to a thousand members uh, in, in the Atlanta area that are all either, like I said, they attend our meetings or uh, they're actively involved with what we're doing. And uh, so those two Facebook groups are pretty helpful because we exchange, we always talk about things that are happening real time and kind of, you know, exchange thoughts and ideas about what's going on in, in the space. And so I would encourage folks if they're interested to, to do that. Uh, we've already talked about Straga. It's it's very easy to join that association, and it's it's a critical time right now. Uh, literally, this next couple of months is the the state legislative assembly is going to be be being decided, and so uh, it's only like fifty dollars a quarter to join. Um, the the website is stroag.org, uh, so uh, uh, stroaga.org. Uh, org, and so please join that association. Um, if I did not mention it before, we, we've talked about the fact that this is a family business. My wife, Marva, does a lot of the heavy lifting. And so she does all of the management of our cleaning operation, uh, as well as all of the staging when we set up the property. So, uh, you know, 
Marva, if, if she was not involved with this business, I wouldn't be here doing it. So I want to, you know, thank her for that piece as well. Right. Um, but the last thing is, and, and we've kind of recognized somewhat of a void in as far as an offering goes to Airbnb or VRBO or other hosts that are doing short-term rentals, such that there's not really a solution that provides help with guest communication. Mm -hmm. And so besides mm -hmm. our, our straight management uh, service, we, we recently started um, something specific just to guest communication. You can have one listing and we can basically do a flat rate per month and basically handle 90% of your guest communication. As you probably know, you get a lot of inquiries uh, from the West Coast or international travelers in the middle of the night. If you don't respond to the inquiries, they're on to the next listing and you miss out on that booking. And uh, you know, so we try to provide that solution as an alternative to uh, short-term rental hosts that they have another solution there. So that's something that we've just recently started. And um, you know, basically we fold it right into our existing process and the, um, reps basically respond on your behalf. So it's on your listing basically that we uh, integrate our channel manager with and um, the guest thinks it's still you communicating with them. And then we manage by exception. If there's something that comes up, they don't know how to answer, they'll, they'll reach out to the host and then they'll kind of save that for the next time it comes up. So right. it's kind of an evolving process as well. Sure, yeah, yeah. What's the, uh, what's the name of the platform again? Um, so Diamond Edge Host Diamond Edge is Host. the uh, solution. Okay. And we do automated tools. So we do a lot of automated, automated messaging as well as kind of a live receptionist 24 seven coverage on guest communication for your listing. Excellent. Excellent. Well, time to wind down the show. Um, man, I, this has been a really great episode. Uh, you know, I've been excited about it for you know a while. So with that said, I know you're in business, you're in real estate, obviously it doesn't have to be a real estate book, but what is your favorite uh, book and why? Well, you know, having being such a core focus on short term rentals, you know, I think there's a, a book that's called Optimizing Your Airbnb Listing that is, uh, has been, been pretty good. It's um, each chapter has kind of got a lot of meat and potatoes in it. So I would recommend that book uh, over the others. I don't have the guy, the author's name in front of me, but, but if you Google that, you'll be able to find it. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've got the book. I actually just finished you reading probably it have again. The book too, yeah. I, yeah, I do. I do. Um, because I'm a pop culture nerd, um, I don't know why I asked this, but I always ask my guests, what's your favorite movie or documentary and why? Favorite movie or documentary and why, huh? <laughs> right there on the spot. That's a you, tough one. Yeah. <laughs> well, you don't um, have to answer it if you don't want to. It's uh, completely up to you or anything that comes to your mind. Yeah, I don't know that I have one particular favorite. I mean, there's... Yeah. There's so many different ones. I don't know that I have one particular one that I could point out as the favorite. All right. Well, what's uh, what's something you would give your what's some advice you would give your 20 year old self uh, based on your life lessons since then? You know, probably listen more than talk. You know, listen listen more than talk and understand the situation before you kind of knee jerk reaction and want to try to solve something without fully understanding what the problem is. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Well, um, where can people find you, Rich? So, um, you know, my cell phone number is 770-540-7638. And the um, email address is rich at diamondedgeproperties.com. And so we also do a market analysis. So if there's a property that you're considering doing short-term rentals with, you can shoot me a text or an email and we can help you with the, that analysis as well. Yeah. And you're on Facebook, obviously. What about Instagram or Twitter or anything like that? Yeah, we're on, we're on all of those under Diamond Edge Short-Term Rentals. So yeah. Facebook, it's Diamond Edge Short-Term Rentals. On Instagram, it's the same thing. Awesome. Any uh, parting advice for uh, the listeners and followers in REI Society? Well, you know, it's, I always say you got to run this like a business and you know, it's, it's all about the guest experience. It's all about hospitality. And if you're going into this, just kind of doing it as a hobby or something on the side, it's really not going to be that successful. So you've really got to fine tune your operation, put systems in place and tools in place to help you manage the business and really treat it as a business because that's really what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate it, Rich. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today. 
Um, it's been a, been my pleasure to talk to you and you to take your uh, you know most important aspect of your life, which is your time, and put it right here in front of all of uh, myself and my followers. Uh, and, well, it's and my I'm pleasure. Hoping, yeah, yeah, and I'm hoping to hoping to have more people that you follow listen to your podcast here because I'm I'm really excited to just uh, to promote you in the next few weeks and looking forward to it. Sounds great, Brandon. I appreciate the opportunity, and I'd, I'd be happy to come out again next time you need me to, to come talk. Okay. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye.